Hello, everyone. This is Dr. Bill with World Bible School, and we're getting all of the different streams going. And we're glad you've joined us today. We hope others will chime in here and watch this broadcast. Um, you can watch it by Facebook Live, or you can find the link a couple of posts down and watch it on the YouTube. Uh, or if you are registered for this class, you can watch it live. This is about a one hour free class. And um, we are doing this to bless you with the word of God. This is our ongoing study of the book of Revelation. And this broadcast is called Take Another Look, uh, thusly titled for taking another look at the book of Revelation because of how it has been taught by many in the past. And so I've been posting all morning. We want you to register for these broadcasts. Try to be a part of these broadcasts out of the, the several billion people on this planet. Uh, surely a good number of you can watch these broadcasts and uh, we would appreciate it so much helping us to promote our teaching ministry. Amen. So thank you again for joining me with at World Bible School in this broadcast as we are looking at the book of Revelation once again to see what we can find out. This is lesson number 43. And if you're just now joining me or joining me for the first time, what I'm sharing with you are some truths about my journey, my personal journey with the Holy Spirit in and uh, around the book of Revelation, because there's things that I have learned that could only be taught by the Holy Spirit. There's not commentaries. There's not a lot of posts or writings out there on these subjects. There are very few people on Facebook that I have found talking about preachers and teachers, ministers who actually teach this the way the Holy Spirit is given to me. And so I, I'm not trying to be a show off or share with you something that uh, you may or may not know. What I'm trying to share with you is revelation from my journey, my experience, what the Holy Spirit has shown me. And I want to tell you, these truths have challenged my personal belief system. And I'm sure they'll mess with your personal theology. But what is important is is that we look at what the Bible says. It's important that we see what the Bible says and look at how the Holy Spirit deals with us or interacts as we look at what I call revelation, which is best defined as the unveiling of the Father's heart. Amen? Praise the Lord. And so uh, as these truths are unveiled in these lessons, no matter how strange or hard they may seem to swallow, I simply ask you to open your heart and ask the Lord uh, to speak to you uh, and, and allow the Holy Spirit to bear witness with your spirit about these truths. I, I just think that many Christians have thrown away a lot of valuable revelation in the past simply because they believed certain things uh, uh, differently for, uh, 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 for way too long. The truth is, Jesus said, you'll know truth and truth will make you free. And if you're not hearing truth, then, you know, you don't feel very liberated by the word. You get an emotional excitement, an emotional high, but not really liberated. So it's important that we get into the word and that we find that place of being liberated by the power of the word of God. So we're looking at the events that surround the Apostle John when he was in prison on the Isle of Patmos. In prison on the Isle of Patmos was one dimensional, his flesh man. But there was another part of him that was experiencing something in another realm, the realm of the spirit. We call it the realm of the spirit or the realm of heaven, the heavenly realm. Uh, heaven is literally in the Greek translated the abode of God. So the abode of God is in you and around you and God is speaking and God is uh, uh, sharing. He is trying to get us to understand that we don't have to live by the dictates of our fleshly uh, 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 surrounding, but we can live out of the realm of the spirit because honestly, folks, we are more supernatural beings than we are natural beings. Amen. So let's get started today as we continue to see what John sees and what he hears next and 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 shows us how that we can operate out of the heavenly realm while ministering in the earthly realm. So let's continue in John, uh, Revelation chapter six, verse seven and eight. Amen. Revelation six, verse seven and eight. <clears throat> it's good to be back after a couple of weeks. So I'm going to keep my voice <clears throat> uh, well wet with water and 
get get done this, this teaching today. Uh, we're talking about the fourth seal. Now, now the Bible, uh, in some translations of the Bible, particularly in the New King James, it says that this heading deals with widespread death on the earth. So you got to ask yourself this question: What is the death that is being spread? And on what earth is he talking about? Because when we say earth in our English language or in our natural understanding, we think of this ball, this globe, the planet earth. When in reality, there is another earth that's spoken of many times in scripture. So let's read as we conclude this fourth seal today. Uh, he says, when Jesus opened the fourth seal, John heard the voice of the fourth living creature saying, come. So John looked and behold, a pale green horse. You'll see in your Bible often a pale horse, but this word means green, a pale green horse. And the name of him, this is a lowercase, so this is not deity. The name of him who sat on it was death and Hades followed with him. The Greek word is actually hadas, followed with him. And power was given to them, those who sat, okay, those who sat on it given to them over a fourth of the earth to kill with the sword, with hunger, with death, and by the beasts of the earth. Now, when we think of beasts, we look at all these weird things, all these movies, all of these, these prophecy preachers who have preached a lot of stuff that actually is not even what the Bible is saying to us. So we want to understand all of these things. And some of these we've already taught on, so we're going to try to move through this as swiftly as possible. Uh, and so we've looked at this pale green horse, him who sat on the pale green horse, whose name was death and Hades, Hadas or hell followed with them. I challenge you to go to your Bible, look at the Greek word for hell, for Hades, for uh, uh, Ghana, uh, Ghana, for Sheol. Look at all the Bible names in your English Bible and find the Greek meanings and see what they mean. It would be very challenging. It'll be very challenging to your thinking. Uh, we have talked about how that they were given power or they were given authority over one fourth of the earth. Now, the word power here is the, the Greek word exousia. And uh, it, 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 uh, in, its con in the context of passage, remember when you're looking at Hebrew and Greek definitions in your Strong's Concordance, your Thayer's or your Greek lexicons, uh, you want to make sure that you look at the meaning pertaining to the context of the passage that you're reading about. So in the context of this passage, this word exousia would mean delegated influence, or in this case, delegated authority or jurisdiction. So as we conclude the fourth seal today, we will focus on this power or this delegated authority being given to them whose name is death. So we've been teaching on that, trying to bring clarity trying to bring an ease to the minds of people who are always worried about death and who are always worried about some evil monster uh, and, and what they call the end time, the last days. And I have been teaching for some time now that the last days, Jesus prophesied about the last days, but he was talking about the last days as he was going to the cross. And so I'm one of those people who are not a big fan or a believer of eschatology. I believe that the last days happened when Jesus went to the cross and we've now entered a new era praise the lord but that's what i believe so now don't turn me off because you may believe something different hang with me to find out the bible says to search the scriptures see if the paul said study to show yourself approved paul said to search the scriptures see the Bereans study to see if those things the apostles were teaching were true or not so don't just look at one scripture or one teaching but look at the context, look at the, the, the context of the Bible and see what's being said. So we want to see how this power over the fourth of the earth is given to kill or destroy something and bring hunger, death, and by the beasts of the earth. What are these beasts? What earth is he speaking about? Now, we know that it has become obvious that for Christ to fully live in us, not that he doesn't, but I want you to hear this because how Christ lives in you is not just by the fact that he lives in you. It's by your the measure of your revelation of him living in you. And so we want to see how uh, Christ fully lives in us to the degree that we can fully live as Christ, as he is, so are we in this world, uh, fully live as Christ in the midst of a hurting humanity 
then death must come. We, we know that this becomes obvious because then death must come to every element of our thinking or to the every fleshly hindrance in us so that we can fully minister effectively to all creation who is presently yearning or crying out as in pain, yet they do not know why. So we want to understand that. <clears throat> However, what are they crying out for? That's a very important question out of Romans chapter 8, verses 19 through 23. That's a very important question. What are they crying out for? Well, what they are crying out for uh, will require sons of God to reveal something greater than themselves. And for the most part, believers are now coming into the knowledge of sonship. Not sonship we've heard in the past, not any goofiness of sonship, but the sonship of Jesus Christ, sons of God, which is having a working knowledge of the full measure of an understanding of Christ in us. I want to tell you, sons of God, I'm speaking not just to Christians today, but those who have come into the revelation that they are sons of God. I want to tell you that the greatest revelation you can gain right now in this time is the knowledge of the full measure of Christ in you. Amen. Now, one thing is becoming clearer to me more and more, which is this. The Apostle John in the throne room of heaven saw good things filled with good news. Thus, the defining of the word gospel. This is the gospel of John, the gospel of Revelation, but it's the gospel. Gospel means good news. It will never mean anything else. So we need to stop trying to take the scriptures and make them say something that somebody else said it means without us first looking at the criteria surrounding interpreting the Bible. One of those is to look at the gospel is as good news. The gospel is not only Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. Yes, it's the gospel of Matthew, the gospel of Mark, and so on. But, <coughs> but everything the Lord has to say to us is good news. Now, I know there are some things in the Old Testament that didn't look like good news, but we need to understand those in, pro in a proper perspective. So as we move forward today, uh, I want to say that it, it, it must become important to believers everywhere to make the book of Revelation only about the revelation of Jesus. Stop trying to make the book of Revelation. I urge you, I, I plead with you, stop trying to make the book of Revelation about something that it is not. What it is, is the revelation of Jesus Christ, which translated in the Greek language means the unveiling of the anointed one. But what? But there's a, a another side to this unveiling, which is what is unveil, unveiled in you. And so that's the greatest thing. That's the mystery that was held from other ages, but has now been made known to the children of God, which is Christ in you, the hope of glory. This one revelation, which is Christ in you, is the one truth that will set mankind free so that they can uh, so that we can live in the earth realm in our resurrected transformed flesh and blood bodies and at the same time live out of a higher realm or a higher dimension in the spirit not inhibited by this natural fleshly earthly awareness yes we'll have this earthly awareness but not be controlled by it that's where we're headed so what John did is this. He found out how that he could live life apart from um, apart from uh, the, the re apart from the, the the restrictions of the earthly realm. He started living out of the spirit, and uh, and and so uh, this is why I believe it's imperative for us to stay focused on the revelation of Jesus Christ, amen? Because what John did is what led me to believe that we can do the same thing. Now, from last time, which would be about three weeks ago, we were looking at the re revealing or the unveiling of the four seals and how that the three horses deal with three aspects of our natural life. So very important here. 
Also, <coughs> also we want to understand that this fourth horse, what we may be seeing here is that the fourth part of our earth must be dealt with by the Lord so that the complete transformation of our mortal bodies will take on incorruptible bodies so uh, as as spoken of by the apostle Paul okay very important here uh, and if i'm talking and it sounds like gibberish hang tight we're we're putting the pieces together now here's what i know i know that this revelation is not popular I know that many Christians would rather hear about beheadings by an, an antichrist, which isn't even mentioned in the book of Revelation. I know that that uh, uh, many Christians would rather take ancient gospel, ancient translations and, and try to talk about beasts and try to talk about big bugs. And I, I've seen the movies. I've, I've read the books. I've been there. I've heard prophecy teachers teach on those things for years. But when I got into the book myself, what I found out was, is those were not the things the Bible said. Amen. Those were not the things the Bible said. And so it's very important that we hear this, even though it's not a popular message. It, it is about the transformation. Uh, and this transformation is absolutely necessary so that we can be effective in answering the cry uh, within hurting humanity. There is no other way for a resolve to be found um, uh, no other way uh, 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 so that so so the reality is this fourth part of the earth is clearly that portion of our earthliness which has not been dealt with by the preceding three horses I'm strictly talking about this this era of the book of revelation personally i think it means this the three parts refers to our spirit soul and body spirit's been dealt with the soul is being dealt with. The body is being dealt with. But the fourth part might be related to the overall defeat of the enemies within us, which has kept us attached or focused on and controlled by this earthly realm. You know, there are four, there are three parts to you technically, spirit, soul, and body. But the reality is, according to scripture, and I can't go there today, but according to scripture, really your soul is in divided into two parts. And, and there's the renewed part and the unrenewed part. And there's a battle there. So we could possibly even allude to four parts here, uh, as the scriptures are trying to tell us. But, but what we want to see here is that the most difficult part of the transformation process seems to involve the letting go of our soulish, selfish life in the flesh, of which part of mankind has had such a hard time conquering on our own. Many of you have spent a lot of time in prayer. Some many of you fast long, many days. Some of you pray long hours. Some of you spend a lot of time in the word trying to get control of your flesh. I want to tell you there's a work in progress taking place in you. It's a work of the spirit. And as you pursue God, understand that he is pursuing you. And in this love relationship that you have with him, change is being made. Things are happening sometimes that you're not even aware of. Amen. So what we want to see is that 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 this part of the process has kept us walking contrary to the complete life in Christ, which we are ordained to walk in from before the foundation of the world. This was God's plan. This is what God decided about us. So we want to understand that Jesus came into our world. Or let's say it this way, Jesus came into our experience, amen? He came into our experience uh, so that he could deal with the entire flesh man as uh, and as he is patiently working in us by the Holy Spirit, we are coming into an understanding of what the four horses represent and the purpose they will have uh, completed in us. There is a completion taking place. You may not see it yet. You may not sense it yet. But this is why, you know, when the disciples walked with Jesus, they walked with him, you know, uh, just by walking with him. But now that we walk with the Holy Spirit in, in, in a little bit, then that takes some explaining uh, scripturally. But, but as we walk with the Holy Spirit, we don't walk with him in the same context as two people that can join hands and walk together. We walk with the Holy Spirit by faith. 
Amen. We walk with him by faith. So it's important that we understand that we're going to have to take the workings of the spirit that God is doing in, his, in sons of God. We're going to have to take it by faith. Now, finally, we read that the rider on the, the green horse was given power to kill with the beasts of the earth. So we want to understand that. So once again, the beast of the earth is not referring to monsters, okay? You need to get into your Bible history, and I'm not talking about uh, history as in uh, taking it verbatim. There's, when you Google something, let me tell you something. You know how dangerous studying the Bible is by Google? I love Google. I love my computer. But I want you to understand something. It's dangerous for you to go to the subject line and enter something in. And then just whatever comes up, take them their word verbatim. You're supposed to study to sow yourself approved unto God. Now, God has approved you. But when it comes to you, if you're going to convey the word of God to somebody, you at least ought to know what you're talking about. So don't just take a, a one reference and say, well, that must be the answer. Look at many writings. Take the Bible. Get your Strong's. Get your other study help and find out what exactly the word of God is saying. So once again, you know, uh, here, these beasts of the earth is not referring to monsters that roam around on this planet. The earth refers to, are you ready for this? Right here in scripture, in context, in line with what we're talking about, the, the word earth refers to our humanity. And these beasts seem to be an element of the, the various aspects of any remaining traces of the fleshly nature within mankind. So it's not like here's the earth and some monster is going to come and destroy the planet earth. That's not it at all. You're watching too many sci-fi movies, okay? And I love sci-fi. But it's the reality is, is that your, your uh, humanity still carries with it some things from the past. And I'm going to share this with you right here and now. But uh, we need to understand that, that the beasts are all things that are already in you that attack uh, your humanity. And there must be a conquering. There must be a release. There must be a, 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 a freedom from the turmoil that's in you. And that's the work that God is doing in you. Now, as I've said once before, the nature of Adam did not make it beyond the cross. I want to say that again. The nature of Adam did not make it past the cross. But religion has preached it to us so that we, and saying that we have a sinful nature and we've heard it for so long that hu human intellect has believed the lie uh, and are living out of that lie. You can believe anything, folks. You can look up at the sky and see that pretty blue sky, that light blue sky, that gray sky. You can see it with the white clouds. You can watch it that, and, and you can say, I believe in my heart, and I say with my mouth that the sky is pink. And you can say that and say that and say that until you actually convince your conscious mind and your subconscious mind that you uh, that the sky is actually pink. You can believe that. You can believe that it's pink and purple polka dotted. And you can believe that, but trying to convince other people of that same lie, what I'm saying is you can live by that lie, but it doesn't mean other people are going to live by that lie. What are people looking for? They're looking for truth that makes them free. So we want to be presenting truth. Now, everything that is necessary to accomplish the complete releasing of the soul control within you so that the transformation of Christ appears in you is the working of the glory of Christ in you. Remember what the scripture said in Colossians, it's Christ in you, the hope of glory. If you want to see the glory of God appear or the glory of God manifest in untold measures, get a revelation of Christ in you. Amen. Okay, let's now look at 1 John chapter 3, verse 2 and 3. 1 John chapter 3, verse 2 and 3. Give me just one moment here. <laughs> I know Facebook is on, but
Okay, we're going to read this from the King James Bible once again because I, I had to not turn my button back on and uh, Facebook Live is still going. So hang with me as we read this again from the King James. 1 John 3, verse 2 and 3. Be beloved, now we are the sons of God, and it doth not yet appear what we shall be, but we know that when he shall appear. And as I was saying a moment ago, hang on to that phrase because everybody's looking for the appearing of Christ without looking at what the Bible says, okay? We've heard the appearing of Christ. We heard the second coming of Christ so much. We totally walked over some scriptures in the Bible that say something about it, but we didn't see when it happened. Okay, when he shall appear, we shall be like him, for we shall see him as he is. And every man that has this hope in him purifieth himself, even as he is pure. All right, the word appear here is not referring to any type of second coming of Christ. So that's the first thing I want to tell you. Here we are in 3 John, way back to the back of your Bible near the book of Revelation, and it talks about the appearing of Christ. But what it says is when he shall appear, we shall be like him. The, the Greek word means to render apparent. So the reality is, is when the appearing of Christ becomes apparent to you, you'll discover that you're like him. That's really what he's saying here. The biblical usage of the same word can mean to expose to view, to make manifest, to show oneself or appear. So the reality is the Bible says that Christ was going to return after his death. And on the day of the resurrection, Christ returned. He spent about 50 days with his disciples from Passover to Pentecost and, and then stepped out of their eyesight. According, I'm giving you what the Greek word, the Greek words mean here. Just a quick overview. He stepped out of their eyesight, but 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 Father, Son, and Holy Spirit stepped into them on the day of Pentecost, and in you, Amen. And now lives and dwells in you. Let's read the same passage out of the New King James Version. Beloved, now we are the children of God, and it has not yet been revealed what we shall be, but we know. That when he is revealed, not when he shall be revealed, but when he is revealed, we shall be like him, for we shall see him as he is. And everyone who has this hope in them purifies himself just as he is pure. So part of this reads the same. The, the example of this is when John simply came to be in the earth realm or in the spirit realm the realm of the spirit he began to live out of christ in a whole new dimension he began to live through christ he began to live in christ who is the hope of glory instead of living out of any dependence on his flesh including body control or soul control or living out of his experiences or living out of his emotions he began to live out of christ that's what the Lord is after in you. Folks, if you've really been wanting to turn me off for the past 30 minutes, uh, you know, I'm glad you didn't because that's what the Lord has been trying to bring you to. Amen. He's been trying to bring you to this place. Now, Acts chapter 17, verse 28. We're going to look at this and then we're going to follow it up and read it out of the message Bible. But here's what it says. Acts 17, 28. For in him we live and move. And have our being, as also some of your poets have said, for we are his offspring. Uh, it's a very, very important word. You ought to look up the word offspring here and see what he is saying. He, he, we are his offspring. He, he will not make us orphans, okay? Look at the Message Bible here, Acts 17, verse 28. We live and move in him. Can't get away from him. One of your poets said it well. We're the God created. I want you to think about that today because we are created so much in God and so much like God that on that day, it was as if God literally stood in front of a mirror and made a carbon copy of himself. Now, I didn't say you are God. I'm not saying that I'm God, but I'm telling you that he mirrored himself in you and I. So we need to understand that. And I think John came to a full revelation of this exact truth and that he came to be that which he was created for. 
hear me again. He came to be that which he was created for. It's not that he wasn't already. It's not that you're not already. It's that he came to a revelation of that truth. Amen. Praise the Lord. Okay, now let's notice this. John, the physical man, ceased to live out of his fleshly, emotional attachment to problems. Do you know people are attached to problems? That's right. People have an emotional attachment to problems. They have an emotional attachment to pain, to sickness, or anything else that this life can bring harm or destruction to them concerning. People have an attachment to sicknesses. People have an attachment to, disease, to diseases. Uh, you say, well, how do you know that, Dr. Bill? You know how many times I've heard people say, my problems, my cancer, my sickness, my infection, my, my this or that. The, the, the reality is Jesus took all of that so you wouldn't have to carry it. So as this fourth seal brings us to the conclusion, here it is that God has already begun this process of placing his power within us. I understand it's there, but it takes a revelation to unleash that power, to ride upon the earth around us, within ourselves, and to pull struggling creation into the glorious liberty that has been revealed, or reserved rather, for God's children. God has a liberty for you that you've not experienced yet. God has a freedom for you that you've not experienced yet, and we're coming into that. The, the, the process has involved killing with the sword of the Word of God. The Word of God is like a two-edged sword. It cuts things, okay, uh, and it removes every hindering element of soulish control. Why I talk about this so much is because I've got a book that hopefully will be out by the end of the year called Soul Control. And we're real dealing with how that you're a multidimensional being and, uh, and and how God is working in you in that area. We, we are learning to control our appetite of other things, not physical appetite or foodish type appetite, but of other things. By redirecting our hunger that brings men to the need of a revelation of Jesus by embracing a death to all things that we have been attached to which involves man's own beast within himself. I hope that brings things into a little bit a better perspective at this point in the lesson. Now, the mystery is, uh, this is a mystery to our human understanding. That's why it feels so strange when we hear this kind of teaching. It's a mystery to our human understanding, but it's not a mystery to those who embrace truth by faith. And that's how you embrace truth. I'm not talking about goofiness, but that's how you embrace truth is by faith. Amen. Now, when Paul wrote the book of Ephesians chapter three, uh, it, it involves uh, this three chapters involve positional truth. But the other three chapters show us how to walk out that positional truth. We call that practical truth. So one is positional truth to show you who you are in Christ. The other is practical truth, which shows you how to walk out who you are in Christ. So let's look at Ephesians chapter 3, verses 2 through 5, and see a little bit of what Paul is talking about. He says, if indeed you have heard of the dispensation of the grace of God, which was given to me for you, how that by revelation he made known to me the mystery. And then in parentheses it says, but I have briefly written uh, uh, already by which when you read or when you read, you may understand my knowledge in the mystery of Christ. And then he says in verse 5, which in other ages was not made known to the sons of men, as it has now been revealed by the Spirit to his holy apostles and prophets. Now, please understand, we're not talking about apostles and prophets today, but we're not denying the reality of modern day apostles and prophets. Um, but what we're talking about is that this mystery uh, revealed. This is called the mystery revealed in that you and I can gain an understanding of the mystery of Christ by gaining a revelation of who Christ is within you. Stop looking for Christ on the external, not that he's not working on the external, 
but nothing on the external generally gets done unless you get a revelation of Christ working on the internal. Paul says, when you read, you may understand my knowledge or uh, in or concerning the mystery of Christ. So how is it we can understand the knowledge? Uh, by revelation, he, Jesus, made known to Paul. All right, let's go on and look at Ephesians 3, verses 8 through uh, eight through 10. To me, who am less than the beast, uh, less than the least of all the saints, this grace was given, that I should preach among the Gentiles the unsearchable riches of Christ, and to make all see what is the fellowship, this word means stewardship or responsibility of a dispensation, uh, a dispensation or age of the mystery, which from the beginning of the ages has been hidden in God, who created all things through Christ Jesus. Here the translators add the words through Jesus Christ, somehow trying to make a better way of a way of making sense out of this because they themselves had a lack of understanding or a lack of revelation about the mystery of Jesus. Verse 10 says, to the intent that now the manifold wisdom of God might be made known by the church, not to the church, but by the church to the principalities and powers in the heavenly realms. So this manifold wisdom of God is made known by the church or released by Christians, by believers, to principalities and powers, keeping them in their place. I heard someone say recently that I'm just going to go toe-to-toe with the devil uh, and face-to-face, nose-to-nose with the devil, eye-to-eye to, with the devil. The truth is, that's not where the devil is. According to Scripture, he's under your feet. Amen. So quit worrying about going toe to toe or eyeball to eyeball with the devil. He's under your feet. You need to learn to keep him there. Praise the Lord. Okay. This speaks of the purpose of the mystery in Christ. So we looked at a little bit about the mystery, the revelation or the revealing uh, of the mystery a moment ago. Now we're looking at the purpose of the mystery of Jesus Christ. But what is the purpose of the revealing of the mystery and who is it for? That's a very important question. The purpose is for the sons of God to stop putting up with all principalities and powers that have past tense ruled in the heavenly realms. Past tense, because Jesus dealt with the devil and all principalities and powers at the cross. Then later, Paul says in Ephesians 6, verse 12, um, uh, Ephesians 6, 12, for we do not. You ever read this before, Ephesians 6, 12? For we do not, look at those words, for we do not wrestle against flesh and blood, uh, but against principalities and powers, the rulers of the darkness of this age, against spiritual hosts of wickedness in the heavenly realms. The way we know that, that we, the, the way we can know this is because Oftentimes, when the scriptures speak of something in one place, it is all spoken of, also spoken of or related to uh, by subject matter in another place in the Bible. So let's take a look real quickly at Ephesians 3, verse 17 through 20. We'll get back on Revelation here in a moment, but let's look at this. That Christ may dwell in your hearts through faith, that you being rooted and grounded in love, may be able to comprehend with all the saints what is the width and length and depth and height to know the love of Christ, which passes knowledge that you may be filled with all the fullness of God, that you may be filled with how much of the fullness of God? How full are you? Filled with all the fullness of God. How does that come? With knowledge. Not now to him who is able to do exceedingly abundantly above all that we ask or think according to the power that works in us. Amen. Praise the Lord. Hallelujah. It's very, very important that we understand that. Very important. You may be filled with all the fullness of God. Glory to God. That is an exciting verse of scripture. So 
there is a power working within us, which is the power of the living Christ, who is the one bringing the final transformation, and it's happening by his spirit and by his power. Praise the Lord. Very important that you and I recognize that. It's very important that we believe that. Okay, now, this fourth part of the earth that we've been talking about is clearly that portion of our fleshliness or soulishness, or uh, as some put it, our earthiness, which has not already been dealt with by the first three horses. But with the fourth horse, there is a conclusion and a termination of the process which we will see in the fifth seal. So praise the Lord. We're moving there, okay? Now, let's move on now to Revelation, uh, and we're not uh, not to, too far from our close this evening, or this, this morning. Uh, well, it's actually this uh, the afternoon here in the U.S. But in Revelation 6, verse 9, he begins to read and says, when he, Jesus, opened the fifth seal. So we've just come out of the fourth seal. We want to see what's going on in the fifth seal because we're looking at the process that's becoming wrapped up. Uh, he says, uh, it, it, when he, Jesus, opened the fifth seal, I, John, saw under the altar the souls of those who had been slain for the word of God. It's not talking about martyrs. I want you to understand that. He's not talking about martyrs. He's not talking about you laying your life down for someone. Jesus already did that, folks. But he's he's talking about souls that have been slain on the altar for the word of God will understand that and for the testimony which they held. And they cried with a loud voice saying, How long, O Lord, holy and true, until you judge and avenge our blood on those who dwell on the earth? Here's a question interjected here in this. Who was responsible for this? Who did not step up to uh, uh, to the plate and do what they were called to do by God, all because they were held back, all because they couldn't wrap their understanding around something? When I teach the book of Revelation or I teach my, pro my program that airs at 10 a.m. on Thursday mornings, Central Standard Time. When I teach in those two shows, what I want to know is, is why can't you wrap your mind around truth? I'm not preaching deception here. Yes, I'm preaching it different, but we've gotten so comfortable hearing the same thing over and over and over that we no longer pay attention to it. So this presents some freshness. Okay, now, uh, verse 11. Then a, a white robe was given to each of them, and it was said to them that they should rest a little while longer until both the number of their fellow servants and brethren who would be killed. So that's future tense, not in our future, but in John's future would be killed as they were. Was completed. So something had to be completed. So this is talking about a completion that has not been completed yet. And so while we see souls slain under the altar, those who were slain for the word of God, again, not talking about dying in this natural life, but we're talking about some things dying in us. What this means is, as the Bible says in 1 Corinthians chapter 15, that how it's going to work and who it's going to work in is each one in his own time. So you need to look at that and study that. But here's the thing about it. Not everybody is going to get this at the same time. So some souls, some souls, soul, soul, not body, not spirit, but some souls, the, the negative part of your soul has been slain under the altar. Those that aren't getting it yet, they're still waiting for them to get it so that this thing can be completed. The fourth seal is an indication that John saw, uh, saw the getting close of the final overthrow of our solical selfhood and everything within us that is contrary to life in the spirit. Solical does not necessarily mean uh, the proper attitude uh, or attributes of the soul uh, that are uh, uh, acceptable. Uh, it can equally mean fleshly. Now, understanding that, the strong word here is the Greek word suke, and it, it, it means the breath or by implication, the spirit. Uh, and so 
it, it can be uh, uh, transliterated uh, from spirit to soul of uh, the natural man. Literally, it is the spirit of God or the life of God working in us, which is causing transformation, folks. It's causing transformation. The biblical usage of this word means the breath of life. And that is Jesus Christ in you, the hope of glory. Hallelujah. That's the breath that's breathing in you to bring this transformation. Glory to God. Now, <clears throat> all of the instruments necessary to accomplish this final transformation are in the Lord's hands and at his command, but requires our cooperation. Our cooperation is so needed, so necessary. We must learn to cooperate with what the Lord is doing. We will see this confirmed much more as we get into the opening and breaking of this fifth seal. And we, we got a lot of teaching on this because it is uh, we, we when we see the finished product of this death working in us. You know, this thing didn't start yesterday. The end of Revelation chapter three talks about some things that must die in us, some things that must come to an end. And, and you know, here again, let me just say this before I go on to Revelation six, verse nine, that the reality is, is that, that we look at the book of Revelation is laid out like this in a chronological order. And, and that's how they do it according to chronology. But I wonder if anybody ever thought about taking the book of Revelation or the Bible rather and stacking it up this way, you would not see very far past the cross, you would find the end of the book of Revelation. Amen. Okay. So that gives us a better perspective looking down on things instead of looking uh, 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 across uh, um, uh, 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 the horizon. And so understand that some things have happened have been completed that we're just coming into the knowledge of them. All right, Revelation 6, verse 9 says, And when he had opened the fifth seal, I saw under the altar of souls of them that had been slain. The word souls here, souls of them that had been slain, are the solical or soulish life within mankind who say yes to God. Understand this. Again, we're not talking about martyrs. We're not talking about missionaries who have died. There are people who have died that thought they died for the sake of the word or the Lord that died unnecessarily. The reality is Jesus died once and for all. The Bible says so. But but uh, it's important to, to get this. Now, this symbolically, this phrase under the altar is where the blood and the ashes of the burnt offerings are found. And we'll get into that as we go also. Now, finally, uh, just to wrap up this lesson for today, we are being killed references our earthly life. When looking at these horses who run through our mind, you ever heard this before? Thoughts are just running through my mind. Well, these, these horses who run through our mind or, or our earth and our experiences that have held us bound. All these thoughts running through your mind, these horses running through your mind in this symbolism is referring to the things that keep telling you, here's why you can't do it. Keep telling you, I can't accept doctrines like that. I can't accept teachings like that. They say it'll set me free, but I just believe in my old religious ways and I'm not going to change. And the reality is, as many people don't, but there's coming a time when God is bringing a change. And Praise the Lord. And I can't talk about that today. But uh, some things are happening, uh, being bound by the things and, and, and have seemed to be to taken away our freedoms in Christ. And God did not want us to do that. So we are also being made alive unto God. Not only does death come to some things, and that's to our fleshly or selfish, soulish control, but in the process of death also comes life. Out of Jesus' death came life. Out of our death in Christ came life. Out of what we're talking about here brought death, but it brought life. And so uh, it, it brings life. We're being made alive unto God as the Lord breaks the seals off of the Christ in our spirit and in our soul so that the life of the Lamb, the life of the Lamb can be revealed through us out of this book of which we are. Out of this book which we are. Okay, the, uh, talking about the book. And let me just say this. Many of you are saying that you've got to be 
uh, your name has to be in the Lamb's book of life. Let me tell you something. Your name is in the Lamb's book of life. But the, the Greek translation doesn't say the Lamb's book of life. It says the book of the Lamb's life. You have been recorded since before the foundation of the world in the book of the Lamb's life. Hallelujah. And that's another lesson for another time. Now, here's what I mean. As, as we wrap this up today, the bondages of the soul and flesh are being dealt with even now so that everything God made you to be as a spirit being can flow out of God, the God-like creation that you are, the nature of God. Everything that God is, the attributes of God can all flow out of you and through you. Though, uh, uh, though those things have uh, been previously uh, veiled and hidden in many symbols and, and, and mysteries in the past have been revealed to us. They have been hard to understand by your natural mind. But these things are in the wonderful realities of the Spirit of God that we are uncovering and that are being unveiled to us and in us and through us, being fulfilled by the life of God's elect. There are so many things that are being unveiled that are being unfulfilled, that are being fulfilled, praise the Lord. Now, let me just say this as I close today. If you're going to be one of those, and, and I say if you, if you and I are going to be one of those who are a part of this, this new covenant remnant, who will be those who bring healing and order to the chaos that's in God's creation, then we've got to be a people who are willing to change some mindsets, change our way of thinking and convert to, you want to talk about converting to something, convert to the mind of Christ. So once again, I ask you this question and as I finish up today, are you ready for what's next? Some of you have never heard me teach on the book of Revelation before, and here we are in lesson 43 and still moving forward. The reality is, is God has some great things in store for you because what's coming next is the continuation of changing of old mindsets of defeat into the mindset of sons and daughters of God who are starting to think like kings, who will operate out of the third heaven dimension. There's other dimensions out there. You'll hear me talk about that sometime. God has a new level of thinking for his people. And so it's time for you to begin to think like a son of God, like one who has received the fullness of God, as we read in scripture today. Stick with me on this journey, would you? I just invite you, please stick with me on this journey because there's so much wonderful truth to be uncovered in each and every lesson. Um, this is about the unveiling of Christ in you and me. This is about how John discovered to live out of the third heaven dimension, which is living out of Christ, and it changed him forever. And now we need to understand that when you read the book of Revelation, you're not talking about changing positions. People say after Revelation chapter three, the word church is no longer mentioned. But anybody ever think to, to realize that the word elect or the word saints was mentioned, that that there are other words even in the Greek language that are that talk about the same thing. Uh, the, the reality is this, folks, that you were seated in heavenly places in Christ Jesus when Jesus sacrificed his life on Calvary. And, and there is no scripture anywhere that ever tells us that that position was changed. Only that we come alive to the revelation of Christ in you, the hope of glory. Revelation, hallelujah. We're seated in Christ Jesus. So here's the, the key to this whole thing. And I'm finished for today. And that is that we must take on heaven's mindset now in this life so that we can experience heaven on earth. Many people want to experience heaven on earth, okay? But we hang on to religious mindsets that prevent us from living out of heaven while we're here in this earth realm. Very important. Think about that, pray about that, study about that, and listen to this lesson again, whether on my YouTube channel, it'll be there in about an hour, uh, World Bible School, uh, Bill Hanshaw Ministries YouTube channel, or whether you watch the Facebook recording over and over again. Get these truths in you because we are headed somewhere, 
And that's rising up as sons of God, sons and daughters of God, kings and priests of the Lord Jesus Christ, a kingdom of priests unto our God, so that we can minister healing and deliverance to the chaos that's in our friends and brothers and sisters all around the world. God bless you, and I'll see you next time on Take Another Look. Bye-bye, everyone. Thank you for joining me. Bye-bye.